Hey everyone, it's Sarah with RegisterNurseRN.com and in this video I'm going to be doing an NCLEX review over acute glomerulonephritis. And this video is part of an NCLEX review series over the renal system, so be sure to check out those other videos. And as always, at the end of this video, you can access the quiz that will test you on this condition. So let's get started. So what is acute glomerulonephritis? This is where there is inflammation of the filtering structure of the nephron. And remember, your kidney contains millions of these little nephrons, and they are the functional unit of your kidneys and help you produce urine. Now, what specific part of the nephron filters the blood. That is the glomerulus. So that is why we call this glomerulonephritis. And what happens is that it's inflamed and it's not working like it should. So it starts to become permeable to proteins and red blood cells. And normally the glomerulus only filters like water, ions, and waste, not proteins and red blood cells. Now for NCLEX purposes, the type of acute glomerulonephritis we're gonna concentrate on is called the post-streptococcal kind. And you'll see why here in a second, why it's called that. But let me review this for a second. Okay, the term glomerulonephritis is an umbrella term for various diseases of the kidneys where there is damage to that glomerulus. Now you can have acute forms, which is what we're discussing in this lecture, or you can have chronic. And there are different glomerular syndromes. You have nephritic syndrome, which is the type of syndrome that this post-streptococcal is, and you can have nephrotic. Now in the next video, we're gonna be going over nephrotic syndrome because that's another topic NCLEX likes to cover. Now, quick review on what's the difference between nephritic and nephrotic. Well, with nephritic, you're gonna see a loss of red blood cells and mild amounts of protein in the urine. However, on the flip side, with nephrotic, you're not gonna see any red blood cells in the urine, hematuria, and there's going to be massive amounts of loss of protein in the urine. So just keep that in mind for the next lecture. Now with this condition, it tends to develop about 14 days after a strep infection. And this could be a strep infection of either the skin or like the throat. And it tends to mainly affect our pediatric patients, usually between the ages from two to 10 years old. So how does this condition happen? Well, what happens is that a person gets strep and they don't seek treatment for it. Maybe the parents of the child knew the kid was sick, but they didn't know that the child really needed to go in and get some antibiotics. So what happens is that the immune system responds to this bacteria by creating an antigen antibody complex. And these complexes start to collect in the glomeruli. Because remember, your nephron receives all your blood from those afferent arterioles, and these complexes will be in there. And as that blood is going at a high pressure in this glomerulus, they're gonna get stuck in there, and it's gonna cause inflammation. So, in a sense, this strep bacteria is not inflaming the glomerulus. It is the immune system causing and producing those antigens that are getting stuck in there. So remember that. It's really the immune system due to those complexes, not the strep bacteria getting in there causing inflammation. So that is why you are gonna see these signs and symptoms about two weeks after the parents or the person reports having a possible strep infection. Now let's take an up close look at the glomerulus and see what's happening in this condition. Okay, so normally your glomerulus is receiving all that fresh blood and it's filtering it out. And what's happening is that as it filters it out, it drips down into what's called the Bowman's capsule. And then Bowman's capsule, all that filtrate will flow down through the proximal convoluted tubule to the loop of Henle, to the distal convoluted tubule, then the collecting tubule slash ducts, and then it'll eventually exit the kidney and you'll void it out as urine. Well, what's happening here, as you can see within the glomerulus, we have black areas. And this is where our complexes have got stuck. And we have some massive inflammation going on. So what is happening, it's causing areas to open up and allow 
those proteins and red blood cells to drip down into Bowman's capsule because normally these substances can't go because they're way too large. But here the inflammation has allowed that. So the red blood cells go down and they start to change the color of our filtrate. And you will see a sign and symptom called hematuria in these patients where the urine is going to look like tea colored or cola colored urine. And this will be one of those really prominent signs and symptoms for why a patient or the patient's parents are going to seek treatment because the urine looks totally abnormal. Then some proteins are going to be lost. And remember, this is a mild amount of protein that will be lost in the urine. In nephrotic syndrome, it's the massive amounts of protein. And what is going to happen when you're losing all this protein in the urine? Your blood levels are going to suffer. So you're going to have low protein in the blood. Now, why is that important? What is the significance of that? Well, because of that low protein in the blood, the patient's going to start to have some edema. And in this condition, it will be mild edema. And you're mainly going to see it in the patient's face or around the eyes. And it'll be most prominent in the morning time, which tends to be common in kidney disorders. So why are we gonna have the most prominent edema in the eyes or in the face? Well, think about your eyes. Your eyelids are very delicate. Um, the tissue is folded, it's pocketed, and that is just a great place for extra fluid to collect and for a person to be able to notice it on another person because the tissue is just so thin. So that's why you're gonna see it there. Now, let's talk about why this is happening because we have low protein. So what in the world does protein do and what's its relationship with edema and water? Okay, let's recap. Here we have a capillary and we have our artery, it branches off into our capillary, we have our vein, it's all just interconnected. And behind it in this brown area, that is your tissue cells. And over here, we have just like a little individual capillary. And within the capillary, your blood is running and the capillary has fenestrations in it which is a fancy way of saying it has pores. And in these pores, fluid and other substances leak out and go into that tissue. Now it's controlled by several different things. First thing that controls it, what's called hydrostatic pressure, which is controlled by your blood pressure. And this controls the amount of fluid leaking out of the capillary into the tissue. Then we have another substance, which is what I really want to hone in on, called albumin, our protein. And it regulates what's called oncotic pressure. And albumin plays a super important role in keeping that water inside the capillaries. So ask yourself, whenever we start to lose albumin, our protein, because we're losing it all, a lot of it in our urine, what happens? There's nothing to keep that water inside the capillaries, less amounts of it. So what's gonna happen? Fluid is gonna start moving out of those fenestrations, those pores, into the tissues. So you're gonna get swelling. And when you get swelling in these patients, depending on the severity of this condition, it leads to what's called fluid overload. Now let's think with our nursing knowledge. Whenever a patient has fluid overload, what are they at risk for? Well, fluid overload load affects the heart. There's way too much fluid in the heart. It's going to increase the blood pressure and it's going to wear that heart out. It'll be able to function for a while, but that muscle of the heart will become weak. So they can end up in heart failure and the hypertension. Also, they can have renal issues because the kidneys aren't able to filter as much as you're going to see here in a second. So we can go into renal failure and they can also have respiratory distress issues because whenever the fluid, when the heart becomes weak and the fluid starts to back up into the lungs, they get congestion in there and they can't breathe. So let's talk a little bit about that renal issues that these patients are going to have. They are going to have decreased glomerular filtration rate and a decreased GFR. So what is this condition? Let the word help you. It is how that glomerulus is going to filter the fluid. So it's the flow rate of filter fluids through the kidneys. It's going to go down. It's not going to be able to filter as much blood. Now, why is this? Well, remember, we have inflammation going on in that glomerulus.
Now, what happens on that immune system, that cellular level when we have inflammation? All those other cells in our immune system come there and congregate. And what this does is it congests the glomerulus. So it's gonna decrease the amount of blood that's gonna be filtered. It can't get through there to filter it so we can get that filtrate. So we have decreased filtration. So ask yourself, what is gonna to happen to the waste that's built up in our blood that needs to get to that kidney to be filtered, like the urea and the creatinine? Whenever we go to draw their blood, they're gonna have increased amounts of VUN and creatinine. Now, how's their urine output gonna be? Glomerulus is not filtering, so it's not really producing that filtrate, also called urine. So we're gonna have low urinary output, also called oliguria. So they're gonna have low amounts of urine. So that's why whenever we talk about nursing interventions here in a second, you have gotta watch that urinary output. Now, whenever they have low urinary, low urinary output, you need to watch how much potassium they're consuming because they're going into renal failure. And if you've ever looked at lab work on a patient who is awaiting dialysis because they have renal failure, you will know that their potassium, you will see it's always super high and their BUN and creatinine will be high. So they will get high potassium levels, so we'll wanna watch their foods they're consuming in potassium because less amounts of that blood is being filtered and we're not being able to maintain that homeostasis of our electrolytes. Now the next thing which I talked about a little bit earlier, is the hypertension. This is one of the big things we're gonna really be monitoring this patient for. And they are getting this high blood pressure. Now, why are they getting high blood pressure? Well, it ties back to all this up here. The fluid overload, they're retaining sodium, they have extra fluid volume. Well, the kidneys isn't able to filter that blood, remove that water, and all those solutes and substances. So we're getting hypertension, we're retaining that, and our decreased GFR is causing our hypertension. Well, if this is not treated, and it, this patient has it for a long period of time, it can lead to a condition called hypertensive encephalopathy. And this is where you have massive amount of blood pressure just being pumped to that brain tissue, which can alter their neurostatus and lead to seizures. And why in our nursing interventions, we're gonna be monitoring that blood pressure very closely. Now let's wrap up all those things we just talked about into those signs and symptoms that a patient may have with acute glomerulonephritis due to a post-streptococcal infection. Okay, and to help you remember that, remember the mnemonic had strep because they had strep and this is why they're presenting with these signs and symptoms. Okay, so H for hypertension, A for ASO, which is an anti-streptolysin titer, it will be positive. This is a test used to diagnose strep. D for decrease, GFR, remember GFR was the glomerular filtration rate, it will be down, hence they'll have low urinary output. S, swelling in the face and the eyes, this is gonna be mild and it tends to be most common in the morning. T for tea colored urine, or that cola colored urine. And again, that's due to that hematuria, those red blood cells leaking into that urine. R for a recent strep infection, they may report to you, well, I maybe I had strep um, a couple weeks ago. I don't know, but I think I might have. E for elevated BUN and creatinine. And P for protein urea, and that will be mild. Now let's look at the nursing interventions. What are you gonna do for this patient who has this condition? Okay. Think back to what we just learned. What is going on with this patient? Because this determines what we're gonna be doing for the patient. Well, we learned that in the most severe cases of this condition, because for NCLEX, we always concentrate on the worst case scenario. They have fluid overload, they have hypertension, and they have some renal impairment. So we want to do our nursing interventions based on that. First thing we want to do is we want to monitor that fluid status very closely. Physicians may prescribe diuretics, which is going to cause the patient to urinate a lot, which will help remove that excessive fluid in the body, but these may not be used if the patient has renal impairment. Another thing we're going to do, we're going to perform daily weights. This is the earliest sign of fluid retention, so it's very important. It's such a simple thing to do. We will get them up 
preferably on a standing scale the same time every day and weigh them. If you have to use the bedside scale, you can, but standing scales are the best. And we will also perform strict calculation of their intake and output, so those I's and O's. Now, with our pediatric patient, because this condition tends to affect the pediatric children, we want to make sure that their urinary output is at least, this is usually the rule of thumb, one milliliter per kilogram every hour. So for every kilogram they weigh, they should be putting out X amount of milliliters of urine per hour. So say the patient weighs 30 pounds. How much urine should they be putting out? Well, you'll want to convert 30 pounds to kilograms, and for every 2.2 kilograms is one pound. So 30 divided by 2.2 is 13.6, so they weigh 13.6 kilograms. So they should be putting out 13.6 milliliters per hour. Now, how about if they weren't putting that out? Say they were putting out like 10. They have low urinary output. As a nurse, you wanna monitor them for hyperkalemia. And we talked earlier about why that is. And we'll wanna restrict foods that are rich in potassium. Next, we'll wanna assess their urine color. Is it getting um, normal looking compared to that tea or cola colored? How's their BUN, their creatinine, which indicates they're going into renal failure? Next, we'll want to monitor them, their edema. Is it, got, is it decreasing in their face and in their eyes? Are they getting better? How do those lungs sound? Are they having fluid overload? Is there crackles in there, which can indicate pulmonary edema? And also, we really, really want to monitor those vital signs, especially that blood pressure. Because remember, depending on how severe they have this, they can have hypertension, which if it's not controlled and they have for a prolonged type well, a period, they can enter into hypertensive encephalopathy. And the physician may be ordering antihypertensive drugs to help combat that. And during this acute phase, when they do have this hypertension going on, you want to initiate bed rest during that time. Diet includes, usually they're on a fluid restriction because we have the swelling going on and a sodium restriction until they are recovered and then they can go back to their diet. And some education you wanna to provide to them is that strep infections can reoccur. So if they ever suspect they have strep, they need to go and get a culture and make sure it's not strep so they can get it treated appropriately if they do. Okay, so this wraps up this lecture on acute glomerulonephritis. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to take the free quiz and to subscribe to our channel for more videos.